Um, question on, this is like 21, 22 from the homework. Um, they give you, uh, and I did extend the homework until this evening, uh, but they give you these two triangles, and we know that triangle ABC, based on the markings, and I think they even tell you in the directions, ABC uh, is going to be congruent to, um, from A to B to C, so you go D, E, F. And we all find X's and Y's here, okay? So my suggestion is I'm just going to pick off, if I want to try to solve for X, I'm going to find an expression that has an X in it. So 2X plus 5, or sorry, 2X plus 51. And that's segment AC, correct? So segment AC would be the first and last letter here, correct? So then what is that going to match up to in this triangle? D to F, right? So then I highlight D to F, and it has an expression with it as well. So now I can set those two expressions equal each other based on the fact that AC is the same thing as DF. From that statement there, we get that 2X plus 51 is equal to 5X plus 6. Okay? Um, so that would be the best way to solve for X. Now I'm going to solve for Y. So solving for y, uh, I'm going to obviously find my expression that has y in it. Okay, so that in this case would be angle B. I come here, angle B is the middle letter, so angle E is the middle letter over there. So angle B, the measure of angle B has to equal the measure of angle E. Well, that means 96, I think it's a plus y in there. Yeah, 96 plus y is equal to 5y minus 24. And then you can solve that one for what? The one thing I want to caution you on, um, and, and I don't know if any of the other ones do this, because some people may have answered this correctly or got those equations correctly without the adequate logic. Okay? Some people will answer that and say, well, I know I gotta link the x expressions together in equations, and I gotta link the y expressions together in equations, because that's gonna allow me to solve for x and y the easiest, right? Okay. But we have we have seen in the past that that doesn't always work. We've seen in the past that you can have equations that have x's and y's in them, and you need to use a system of equations to solve them. Um, there will also be times where uh, maybe the pictures provide you. Uh, kind of what we call extraneous information. So all these, I think, look like they're all the same. Um, I might give you, uh, let's say, angle A here to be, um, you know, 0.2x plus 3y, and maybe I come down here and tell you uh, angle F is 3x plus 20. I put in extra expressions just to throw you off, just so that you can't just accidentally, through the use of the wrong type of logic, get the right equation. Does that make sense? Okay. I think a lot of times people um, will get an answer using incorrect logic, and because the answer just got, they, they entered or got the answer because of just basically happenstance or coincidence. Um, that they think then that they can use that process on other problems, and you can't, okay? Um, so the logic there that we're, we want to use in that question is the fact that when we have a congruent statement of triangles, then we can use CPCTC to show which segments are congruent to which segments, with which angles are congruent to which angles, and then fill in their, their expressions and create equations. Does that kind of help? Good? All right. Um, so, 21, 22, 23 on the homework. That way. Um, you will most definitely see that on a, a test or a quiz for this chapter. Uh, and things like that. I've got a couple um, built to where they throw in these extra expressions that you don't use um, just to kind of be detractors, to kind of be, uh, to distract your attention to, to what's supposed to be going on. Um, I'd like to 
do a continuation of what we were talking about Monday with angle, angle, side, and angle, side, angle. Um, so I'd like to kind of go through an exercise here. Uh, we're going to do this proof. It's going to be the exact same proof, but I want to do it multiple ways. because I want to prove some points with you here uh, about theorems, how important theorems are, what their necessity is, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and I think this is a, a, a good situation uh, to be able to demonstrate why theorems are theorems, why we have them, why do we need them, okay? Uh, so go ahead and write that stuff down. Uh, what I want to talk about here is angle one real quick. Angle one and angle two, those are, those are these angles on the outside of the triangle. Those two angles there, okay? Those are one and two. What I want to do this first is uh, to kind of go through the kind of the most deliberate, most direct way uh, of proving this to be true. Basically, what we want to get through here is to show AB congruent to ED. And on the way of doing that, we need to show that those two triangles up there are congruent. So that's our overall goal. Show those two triangles congruent first. Okay. Uh, so we need to be able to find three congruencies of the parts of the triangle. Okay, right now all we have is one. We have AC congruent to CD. There's only one congruency uh, of those two triangles. The other congruency, one and two, angle one and angle two, they're not parts of the triangle. Now, they're related to the triangle, but they are not parts of the, the six components that make a triangle, three angles and three sides. Angle one is neither of those, and angle two is neither of those. Okay? Um, why do they, if they, if they give that to me, they, they're probably giving it to me on purpose. There's a reason behind it. I probably have to use it and address it, okay? As we go through our, our general process, um, we look for a vocabulary in our given. Is there any vocabulary? Nope. Okay, so we skip that step. And then look at my picture. What jumps out of your picture? What, what is one absolute true congruency that you know from your picture? What did we see? We talked about it here. There's one congruency in that picture that you absolutely know just looking at the picture. Vertical, Vertical angle. So is that still present here? So you've got a vertical angle right here and a vertical angle right there, right? So I'm going to call that angle BCA and angle ECD. So our vertical angles theorem says vertical angles are congruent. So that's pretty nice. We've got right now, we've got two congruencies. We've got a uh, side and an angle. Okay. So I could either find maybe another side, and that would meet side, angle, side, right? Could I find maybe another angle, and that meet angle, side, angle? Could I find another angle and it'd be angle, angle, side? Okay? So we need one more, we need one more congruency. My argument is that congruency is probably going to be an angle. To find congruent sides is very difficult. You need midpoints and bisectors to find segments congruent. Okay? Um, unless you go through segment addition, which is a much more tedious, long, arduous process that, that usually we, we don't want to go through, okay? Um, and we can't here. We don't, we don't have anything uh, segment addition-wise that, that we could use. So what do we do, all right? 
they give us angle one congruent to angle two for a reason. Okay, let's look at angle one real quick. What would you say about angle one in comparison to that angle right there? What would you say about those two red angles with one another? Supplementary. So let's write that. Let's write the angle one and angle BAC are supplementary. And that's just by looking at our picture, knowing that those two angles together form that straight angle. Okay, so we, we meet the, the requirements of being supplementary. Can you say the same thing then about angle two and angle EDC? So let's say angle two and angle EDC. I'm just going to put, you guys know what those marks are called? Ditto marks. Okay, it's on the right R supplementary again. But that is, does anybody remember the reason for that? When they form that line, they're a pair of angles that form a line, linear pair posture. Okay. What's supplementary mean? It's a vocabulary where we just introduced into the problem. Okay, these two angles are going to add together to give me 180. So measure of angle 1 plus measure of angle BAC equals 180 degrees. Definition of that vocabulary word. Definition of supplementary angles. If I said that about 1 and BAC, can I say something about 2? And EDC? All right, everybody. Now remember, this this proof process is founded in patterns, founded in being able to see things, recognizing things we've already done in the past, and trying to use that in our current situation. Are those two values the same? 180 and 180, right? Haven't we in the past then said if those two things are the same, then these expressions that make them have to be the same as well. So we should be able to say measure of angle 1 plus the measure of angle BAC equals the measure of angle 2 plus the measure of angle EDC. And remember, if the 180s were the same, why I could say if those two sums equal each other, what that process is called? Substitution, good. If you're thinking transitive, we talked about how transitive in the past might be an acceptable answer there as well. Okay. Um, but now, pattern-wise, whenever we get a sum equal to a sum, we usually don't like comparing sums to sums. We like to compare individual things to individual things. So if I've got a sum equal to a sum, let's see if there is something on the left-hand side that is identical to the thing on the right-hand side, okay? Now, in regards to the way they look and how we've written them, there's, not, there's a measure of angle 1 on the left, but there is no M angle 1 on the right, correct? And same thing for BAC. There's, no, there's a BAC on the left, but there's no BAC on the right. But remember what these things refer to. Measure of angle 1 is a number. We just don't know what that number is. Does that make sense? Is the measure of angle 2 a number? We just don't know what that number is, right? But right there, don't we tell everybody that whatever those numbers are, they're the same? Does that make sense? So if you have an equation, let's say I have an equation that's like 30 plus 
10 is equal to 30 plus 2x. What happens to those 30s? Cancel each other out. And it's because I can subtract 30 from both sides. Okay? So, these numbers are the same, so we can wipe them away. We can cancel that with that and say measure of angle BAC equals the measure of angle EDC. And that process of wiping away or canceling like that is the subtraction property. And then angle BAC, what could be congruent to angle EDC by our definition of congruency. That's kind of a, we talked about how that's a kind of technicality step there by changing back to congruence. Okay. So now we just generated, in our, in our proof, we generated another congruency. Let's go back up to our picture. Let's fill that congruency in. Okay. We're saying that angle BAC, BAC, which is that angle now, and angle EDC, which is now that angle, they are congruent to one another. Okay? So if I look at just the stuff that's on the inside of my triangles, do you have three parts in that triangle? And do you then have three parts in that triangle? Does that make sense? What's the order of parts in both those triangles? Angle, side, angle. So now we can say triangle, um, show ABC. Triangle ABC is congruent to triangle A to B to C, so DEC. And you said angle, side, angle. And let's see here, I actually wanted to write that in black. And in step nine, A, B can go up to E, D. That's what we're trying to get to. A, B, first two letters here. E, D, first two letters there. So what we talked about at the beginning of class, those should be congruent through CPCTC, right? So it took nine steps, okay? Um, the way you number things on the left-hand side, okay, because here, step three, is actually two things. Step four, there were two things. So maybe you could, you could argue maybe this is 11 steps. I think here when we subtracted these angles one and angle Two, I, we kind of skipped a step. We should have probably said that measure of angle one was equal to measure of angle two instead of just taking that through the congruency from, from the given. So th this we did it nine, but maybe you could argue that 13 steps would be more appropriate. Okay, I would accept that full credit right there. Um, but there's some stuff there that I wrote and read all for a reason. Okay, if I were to give you this original information, Let's look at this picture. I'm going to erase everything in the picture. But if I were to give you the fact that this angle, angle number one, let's say it's um, 150 degrees. And if angle one and angle two are the same, angle two has got to be 150, right? What's that angle got to be? Got to be 30? What's that angle got to be? 30 as well, right? Are those two angles, 30 and 30, the same? Okay. Then that's exactly what we did here in red. All that work there in red says exactly that for every number like 150 that you could have chosen. So if I would have chosen like 148, I got 32 and 32. I should, could have chosen 145 and got 35 and 35. Okay. It proves that to be true 
no matter what that 150 degree measurement is. Okay? The stuff in red, though, can be condensed. Okay? So I don't know how you want to do this, but I'm going to come over here to the side. And I'm just going to rewrite this proof again. I have AC congruent to CD. That was given. Angle 1 congruent to angle 2. That was given. I still need angle BCA congruent to angle ECD by vertical angle theorem. Okay? And then it took all of this red stuff, all of this red stuff to get number seven, to get angle BAC congruent to angle EDC. And if you remember this, this, this is somewhat of an obscure theorem that we haven't spent, you know, like side, 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 angle, side, these theorems, we're going to spend weeks on these. So they're going to be very um, prevalent, and you're, you're going to know them like the back of your hand. There's a theorem that we used, we talked about a couple weeks ago, probably over a month ago, um, that we used that day, maybe the next day we used it, but we haven't used it since. Okay? And it says exactly this right here. Okay? This process right here. It said, if two angles are congruent, I want to rephrase it, if two angles are I messed it up. Let's write the supplement or the converse. If two angles are supplements to the same angle or congruent angles, then the two angles are congruent. And when I say the two angles here, that's referencing those two angles that we started with in the if, if statement. If two angles are supplements to the same angle or congruent angles, would you agree that angle BAC and angle DEC, those are two angles? Would you agree with that? Are they supplements to congruent angles? Is that angle right there a supplement to angle one? And is that angle right there a supplement to angle two? And we're angle one and angle two congruent angles. Does that make sense? Then that theorem says if that's happening, then angle BAC and angle EDC, which you start with, had to be congruent to one another. Okay? Now, I've got that all written out there. If you want to write it out that way, that's fine. That's what the theorem says. But it had a name. So it's kind of a pain in the butt to write. It's called the congruent supplement. Theorem. And what that provides us with right away, guys, is those two triangles having three things marked in them, and I can now jump straight to step four is going to be now what was step eight down here. So triangle ABC can grow to triangle DEC. Same reasoning, angle, side, angle. And then the fifth will be A, B, congruent to E, D, by C, P, C, T, C. So we said this had nine steps. Could be 13 steps. But knowing one theorem, and this is the, this is the purpose of theorems, knowing one theorem, which I, I would argue if we, if we use that 150 and 30 idea, with the specific values, it's not that difficult of a concept. We cut our work in, in, in more than half, okay? Go from nine steps to five steps, or 13 steps to five steps, okay? There are some proof, guys, if we, if we didn't use the appropriate theorems, it, it might take 30 or 40 steps to do a proof. But if we use the appropriate theorems, it might take three or four steps, okay? The theorems that we come across and that we – interact with the purpose for them is to be able to make this statement, this red argument, a lot more efficiently than with uh, the five steps that are here. I can more efficiently say that right there. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, I want you to write this again. Thank <laughs> you. 
my my biggest concern, okay, as as a math student, and then I turn turn roles and 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 as a math teacher, and knowing that you guys are going to be assessed on a test that I have no knowledge of what the questions are. My concern is that I'm going to teach you one way, or you're going to. I would teach you three or four ways, and you're going to say, oh, I don't need his three or four ways. I need the one way that I learned it and I understood it because now I can use that one way whenever I want to. But you get to the end of course exam, and the way some of those questions are written is that they, they write them so that they take you down a particular pathway, and you have to do that problem this particular pathway. Well, if your one way doesn't align with that pathway, then you're kind of stuck, right? Okay, you don't you don't have any option. Okay, um, but if I can show you three or four or five different pathways, and you can, I'm not saying master all three, four or five, but understand aspects of those three, four or five. When you get to something that you can't, or or the question is designed so that you cannot use your go-to method, do you have alternatives? Okay, so I want to make sure you have those alternatives. Okay, now I'm seeing a lot of us. Not having notes out, okay? Those of you that don't have notes out, you're going to be really, really, really against against it when, when I give you a test or a quiz and I say, hey, everybody's got handwritten notes. Go ahead and get them out. And then you have absolutely nothing, okay? Um, that's going to suck, okay, for you. All right, so given, given AC, congruent to CD, again, we've got that congruent to that. Um, go through... I'm just going to cheat here and write given this way. So I'm going to write it again. Uh, I'm still going to set that angle. It's going to go to that angle. So let's say angle BCA is congruent to angle uh, ECD. Okay, and that's vertical angles theorem. So the next thing I want to do is I want to get a congruence here. We, we've already shown that we, can sh we, we have the ability to show that angle congruent to that angle. So I don't want to do that. I, I, that would be going the same route we've already done. So I want to see if we can, we can show this blue angle congruent to that blue angle. See if we have a, a, a technique to do that. And we should. Okay, I'm going to come to the side and see if we remember a theorem that we talked about a couple weeks ago. If I have that picture right there, this is angle B, C, and I call that angle 1. Does anybody remember the relationship between the measure of angle 1 and the measurement of angle B and C? Okay, good. So measure of angle 1 should equal the measure of angle B plus the measure of angle C, right? Do you remember the names for those types of angles? This was an outside, it was an exterior angle. So these would be interior though, right? You remember, they're, but they're far away, correct? What was that word for far away? Remote, good. So a remote interior angle. So that, we're going to use that term. See if that one... Uh, kind of helps us here. So, in doing that, the exterior angle that I want to focus on is angle 1. So, let's write measure of angle 1. If we just look at that triangle, would you guys say that measure of angle 1 is equal to the measure of angle B plus then, I'm going to have to name this by three letters. So, let's say measure of angle uh, BCA. So that angle right there, that outside angle, is equal to those two added together. Is that okay? Let's go back to the other triangle. Oh. Come on. All right, let's go to this triangle over here. Put that stuff away for the moment. Would we be able to say that the measure of angle 2, 
that exterior angle is equal to that one plus that one. So again, I'm going to say measure of angle E plus, and this one's got, it's going to have multiple angles at C, so I should call it by three letters. So let's call it measure of angle E, C, D. And you guys said that was remote interior angles. So we had a theorem that said the remote interior angles theorem that laid out that sum for us um, to be a fact. Okay. So if that's the case. And this is this is very similar to the first. Now we're using different relationships, but this one said we had we had both these. 180s, right? And because they were the same, we took these blue things and set them equal to each other. Well, this is very similar. We just don't know what that number is. Okay? We don't know um, that they're 180. Maybe they're, they're obviously not 180. Maybe they're both 150, or maybe they're both 140. Maybe they're both 160. Maybe they're both 3. I don't know. But we do know a relationship between angle 1 and angle 2, don't we? Aren't they the same? So if those two things are the same, then what does that tell you about that sum compared to that sum? Very equal. Measure of angle B plus measure of angle BCA is equal to measure of angle E plus the measure of angle ECD. Pattern-wise, that's the same thing we did in the first question. The first time we approach this, it's the substitution technique. Okay, pattern-wise then, in the first time we did this, in all the other situations that we've done this, when we have a sum equal to a sum, we want to see if there's something on both sides that is the same. Now, they're not written the same. They're not, the, they're not cut and paste names, okay? But don't I have right here BC, the same thing as ECD? BC, or sorry, BCA is equal to ECD. That number, whatever is hidden behind it, okay, whatever is hidden behind that symbol as a number, and whatever is hidden behind this symbol as a number, they have to be the same, being told right there. So can I cut those out? That makes sense? And that cutting them out or canceling them out or removing them is subtraction. Okay, so once we have their, their measurements the same, we can say that they're congruent by definition congruency. Now I'd be talking about those two angles up there congruent. If I look at that triangle on the left, do you have three congruencies drawn in your picture? But now what is the order of those parts? It's still two angles, but is the side between them or is the side excluded? It's excluded, right? Oh, that matches that matches one of our theorems. If I say triangle ABC um, and DEC are congruent, I can say that because we go angle and then followed by an angle. Angle followed by an angle. And then this side here is obviously not between the two angles. So we just put that side on the edge, that angle, angle side. And that's one of our, our four theorems right now. Our four, I guess that's, a, that's actually a theorem. The other ones are postulates. Um, but that allows us to say that the two triangles are congruent. And if the two triangles are congruent, then AB and ED are congruent by CPCTC. So as we look at these, okay, the first two ways that we did it, these two ways are identical. They are identical. One took nine steps, one took five steps, and I'm saying they're identical because the red stuff in the second statement, the second proof, is consolidated into a theorem. Okay? Um, but that third way, 
it uses a complete different congruency. Okay, it uses angle angle side instead of angle side angle. So my my hope is that we realize that when we do proofs, you might you might not see things logically like your neighbor does. Okay. And this is the thing I always get people, well, I study with my friend, and, and she understood it, but I didn't understand it, and that kind of thing. But you might not logically understand it the same way that they do. As long as you get the same conclusion, that's fine. But the way that you go about those conclusions might be different. Okay? Um, if you did a quick Google search of um, known proofs for Pythagorean theorem, Spell it right. Three hundred sixty seven different known, validated, confirmed proofs for A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Okay. Um, as you go through courses and do uh, proofs within courses. I'll, sh I'll show you kind of what happens as you move on through high school. We did a proof the other day in college algebra. This is the only way you can do this proof with the algebra that, that my students know. But we started doing proofs kind of like this. Okay. Now it's more algebraic than it is the geometric proofs that we're doing, but there's one way of doing it. Okay. Um, there will be times where maybe something like this can be done three or four or five different ways, okay? The, the Pythagorean theorem is proven using this type of stuff uh, most of the time. Sometimes there's some geometric proofs. Um, but there's 367 ways of doing it. So when you say, give me the one way of doing it, there isn't one way a lot of times. When you get on the end of course exam, I, I'm going I'm to say 95% confident that they're not going to hand you that test and give you a blank proof and say, fill it out. If they did, I think, I, in my opinion, that's what I would want as a student. Give me freedom. Give me the, the ability to, to write down everything that I possibly know and let me piece things together. Okay? I, I prefer that. But when they start to fill in steps for me and fill in reasons, and I got to fill in the, mix or the, the blank spots, they're directing me down a certain pathway. Does that make sense? If I'm a person that all I'm worried about is Mr. Fay said, we went over this this way, we did this proof this one way, nine steps, memorize that, commit that to memory, whatever, and then I see that, that same type of question on the end course exam, but they've got it auto-filled, and they've got it as set up as five steps. But I never really worried about how to do it with five steps because I, I could do it with nine. Am I going to be able to answer that question very accurately on that test? Does that make sense? The, the, the way they structure some of their questions dictate the pathway that you have to go through. So my hope is when we go over multiple ways of doing something, you don't just limit yourself saying, I already know the one way. I'm not going to really listen to, to the other discussions that we have. Okay? Um, and the reason I talk about that is because in the past, I've had people do that. They take that test, or they take a, an ACT, or they take an SAT, or a college entrance exam, and they say, hey, you taught this, but that wasn't the way this question was asked. That wasn't the way we did it, how I was supposed to do it. Um, and, and we talked that over and said, okay, yeah, well, that's the way you learned it, but when we talked about it three, four, five different ways, you didn't pay attention to those three, four, five different ways. Okay? So this is the last one I want to do. This one shouldn't take too long. How many triangles are up there? Four. Okay. Would you guys agree that this overall one probably, though, isn't a congruent one? By its structure, it cannot be congruent to the other three. Okay. So when I'm trying to prove triangles congruent, that's something I think about. Okay. You know, I see multiple triangles up there. I try to think, okay, which ones, by their structure, even though we're not supposed to go off of looks, would most likely be the ones that I'm going to be inter interested in, okay? So it's going to probably be triangle one, triangle two, or triangle three that we're going to try to, to relate here, okay? So AB is going to be the CB. 
A D is going to go to C D. Do you guys agree that when we put our markings in there that we know two things about that blue triangle? And we also know two things about that yellow triangle. Does that make sense? Now we also we we do know two things I guess about this bottom one, but those are the same markings and that that's the issue here that we don't use the bottom one cuz it it's got two markings in it, and then it's not going to have, it doesn't relate to the two congruencies in that triangle. So really what's going on here is that that extra line AC really isn't necessary. It's there to be a visual, a visual distractor again. Okay? Um, if I look at those triangles, you've got two congruencies in both of them. I need one more. What's the, by looking at my picture, what is the congruency that we can get from the picture here? BD can grow into BD, right? It's a reflexive property. So those two triangles congruent then? What's the what's the uh, congruency theorem or postulate that says they're congruent? What parts do you have? SSS, good. Side, side, side. Okay, so that's awesome. That's That was, when we do these problems that have triangles in, that's the first test. Regardless of what I want to prove, that's the first test. Once I get to that, I now want to look at my proof statement and see if they match. Now, if they match, I'm done. If they don't match, we've been working on this. If they don't match, the next thing is a CPCTC statement, right? Okay, so let's think about what that CPCTC statement says. It says corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. So that's talking about parts of the triangle. Corresponding parts. So in reason number, or sorry, statement number four here, right here, I'm going to have either segment congruent to a segment or an angle congruent to an angle. That's all I can write for a CPCTC statement. Well, that doesn't match up to my proof, does it? But if I want to get to that proof, if I want to show that there is something that bisects that pink angle right there, what things do I have to show congruent? If I want to show that I have an angle bisector, don't I need angles that are congruent? Okay. Do you see that I'm going to need that angle right there? A, B, D, angle A, B, D is congruent to, would you agree that I'm also going to need that angle right there? C, B, D. Now, angle bi usually the way that we use an angle bisector is that I tell you you have an angle bisector and then you give me the two angles that are congruent from it, right? But definitions are reversible, which means that if you give me two congruent angles, okay, and they are adjacent, like these two are, then I can show you, I can tell you, then that thing that is between has to be an angle bisector, right? The thing that is, the object that is creating those two congruent angles has to be a bisector. So at this stage here, we're now going to go one step further and say, now that I know that these two purple angles or pink angles here are congruent, then I know that BD had to bisect angle A, B, C. And the reason is because of the definition of an angle bisector. If I have a segment 
or a ray that is creating two congruent smaller angles out of a larger angle, that ray had to be a bisector. Okay? So that's, that's progressing these proofs a little bit further. We've worked on stopping a side, 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 stopping a side, angle, side, angle, angle, side, that type of thing, and being done with the proof. We've worked on going one step further with CPCTC. Okay? Now the ultimate goal is to go even further. It's okay, now that I've got CPCTC and a statement from that, what does that lead me to further? What, what, what additional arguments can I make about my picture, about my triangles, that type of thing? So that's where this is leading to. That's going to help us kind of open the door to section four or five uh, that we'll start talking about tomorrow. Okay? Uh, no homework this evening. I should give you homework for last participation, but I won't today. 